One of the reasons that people like me are so excited for the new Mac Pro is because of these PCIe expansion slots. And while I know to some of you Apple fanboys, this might seem like a new and novel concept, it's not. They've been the industry norm for many years. And cards like these can expand the capabilities of your PC, just like a shirt like this can expand your confidence. LTTstore.com. The question is, will these cards, which are very much the norm in the PC industry, work at all on a Mac? Let's find out. First up, the cheapest and simplest card, and that's this thing. You see, I.O. on the new Mac Pro is not very good. There's only four Thunderbolt 3 ports and only two USB-A ports. And I don't know about you, but I'm not pro enough to be all Thunderbolt right now. I still need a lot of USB-A devices, and so this card, for about $35, can add five USB 3.1 Gen 2 uh, USB Type-A ports to the back of your Mac Pro. So once we go ahead and get it installed, we'll see if it works. The best way to test it is to, obviously, insert a USB device. Ready, set... Uh, ready, set, and the keyboard will obviously work. It doesn't work. You see, here's the problem. This card and most USB devices require external power. Unfortunately, they don't use PCIe power, which is what the Mac Pro supports. They require a SATA power connector. Now, in a PC, this wouldn't be a problem because every power supply comes with many SATA connectors. This one does not. But here is the really frustrating thing. Apple sells a device with SATA power capabilities. That's this, the Promise Pegasus J2i. Really what it is, is it's a metal box that sits inside the frame of your Mac Pro. And it includes an eight terabyte hard drive with the necessary cables to connect it to your motherboard for $400. This little cable is the one that we need. It connects to the 10 pin power header on the motherboard and then provides SATA power. Problem is, that's not really a standard connector. It is a 10-pin Molex connector that does exist, but, uh, you know, finding the right cable for that is, is nigh impossible. I've looked everywhere. I've asked everyone who knows things. It's a custom connector. Does that mean that Apple will sell it eventually? I don't know. I hope so. Does that mean that the third-party market might start making stuff for it? I don't know. I hope so. But for right now, this thing is kind of just a bit of a paperweight. Next up, storage. On our $6,000 Mac Pro, Apple gives us the benefit of having a monstrously sized 200, wait, 256 gig SSD? Come on, Apple. Even the $5,000 iMac Pro, which uses the same SSDs, by the way, as we discovered in our teardown, you should definitely check that if you haven't seen it already, comes with one terabyte for $1,000 less. Look, we can probably add our own storage, namely by way of this, an NVMe SSD from Samsung. This is a 970 Evo. These are relatively inexpensive. This is a 500 gig drive that we picked up for $100. There is one downside though. Apple's keen on their SSDs is proprietary. So we need to use one of these. It's a little adapter card. You can pick these up very, very cheap. And all they do is convert the NVMe signal into one that can communicate over a standard PCIe slot. So let's plug that in, give it a try and see if it works. This one worked great. Because it was an unformatted drive, uh, Mac OS prompted me to initialize the disk, which upon clicking did nothing. But if you enter disk utility, it shows up right here. Samsung 970 Evo Plus, 500 gigs. I can press erase. I can choose the formatting that I want and call it internal Samsung. I can give it the uh, formatting style that I want and the scheme, press erase, and done. It's ready to use. Pretty sweet. Fun fact, it's substantially faster than the SSD inside the computer, that puny 256 gig one. So if you don't have the budget to buy an SSD directly from Apple, this is a stellar choice. And this probably goes without saying, but one of the other really cool things about it is, well, this. I'm installing macOS Catalina on that Samsung drive. And so you can use it as your primary boot volume. macOS lets you choose. In fact, you could even remove your original SSD from the Mac Pro and it would still boot up fine. So if you want to, you know, not shell out the extra cash on a higher end SSD from Apple, just get the base model and put in your own. Really cool. A pro machine, however, probably requires a pro storage solution. And as much as I love little NVMe drives, they're not the most reliable things on the planet. But these are. You might not know about these. 
You might though. They're called U.2 drives, and these are very, very, very common in server applications and enterprise applications. They are extremely reliable. You can run these things for tens of thousands of hours and write petabytes of information back and forth without them failing. And uh, they have very excellent heatsink enclosures that work well inside of a chassis case. I picked this one up, a one terabyte version that did come out of a used server, but with only 800 hours of runtime on it for just over $100. It's a lot cheaper than my NVMe drive SSD and a lot more reliable. And just as that drive, you too can communicate this over standard PCIe slot by using one of these cheap passive adapters. It is a PCIe X4 device, so it's not going to be quite as fast as the latest and greatest NVMe drives, but it is a heck of a lot more reliable. Well, assuming we can even get it to work. Let's find out. Okay, this one has me stumped. You see, if I open disk utility, it doesn't show up at all. And so I decided to open terminal and run a command that allows you to list all drives, even if they're not recognized by disk utility, uh, disk util list. I run that, nothing. I get my internal drive and the you know, NVMe Samsung drive we just set up and, and that's it. But this is where it gets really weird. In Windows, the operating system with extraordinary amounts of pop-up bloatware in disk management, this Intel SSD does show up, which makes me think it's a driver issue with Mac OS because these aren't intended to be used on Macs, I don't think drivers are available, but there were some people in the Hackdosh community that said that it worked fine once they did a firmware update. So I'm going to try that in Windows with the Intel SSD toolbox. Isn't Windows great? Intel SSD toolbox. Let's see if it works out. Okay, so it actually goes deeper. It turns out that this Intel drive was supported in Mac OS until Catalina. Apple removed the drivers because apparently they just decided they were no longer needed. A lot of Hackintosh people got left high and dry. And uh, so on the Mac Pro, that Intel drive is going to be a no-go. Other U.2 drives, yeah, maybe, but maybe you're better off sticking with NVMe. You're already sick of our PCIe devices? Really? We're only halfway through. All right, fine. We'll take a break and talk about memory, RAM. Now, Apple actually sells RAM upgrades for the Mac Pro on their website. And if Apple sells them and allows you as the user to upgrade them, it means literally a dog could upgrade the RAM in the Mac Pro. It is very, very simple. You should not, however, in my opinion, buy RAM from Apple. A lot of people think Apple's RAM is special or unique or proprietary. It's not. It's just standard RAM made by SK Hynix. And you can find the specification that Apple has in all of their Mac Pros very inexpensively. This uh, 64 gig kit we purchased, I bought for $200 or something like that. And Apple charges, I think, nearly a thousand for the same configuration. This is ECC memory, so it is error correcting, and it's registered memory. If you don't know, you can look up your configuration on apple.com. All Mac Pros that ship with less than, I think, 300 gigs from the factory come with RDIM. And then uh, larger capacity Mac Pros, which you're probably not upgrading the RAM because you've got like a terabyte already, uh, come with LRDIMs. So registered memory, ECC, and 2933 megahertz. Now, Apple ships all of their computers with 2933 megahertz, although the lowest end configuration, the 8-core, the one that I have, runs RAM uh, at 2666 because that's a limitation of the CPU. But they still ship higher frequency memory, probably for making it easier for them and because nobody's buying the 8-core, but also because if you decide to upgrade the CPU in the future, you can actually take advantage of that higher clock speed RAM. So if you plan to buy and upgrade your own, you should probably get 2933, like I did. Now, installing it is actually pretty simple, and Apple's own little doors where the memory is hidden behind give you uh, placement configurations so that you can find out where to put which DIMM where. The downside is, is that it doesn't tell you if you have uh, varying capacities where to place stuff, and this becomes a problem. I bought a 64 gig kit and I'm adding it to a 32 gig kit for a total of 96 gigs. But that also means that I have four 8 gig DIMMs and four 16 gig DIMMs and you do need to put them in the correct locations to optimize the channel performance. Luckily, Apple's own website actually provides instructions on where to place uh, DIMMs if you have varying capacities. Really cool, Apple. Way to go. Good job. It's pretty easy to upgrade RAM in the Mac Pro easy if you can read. You see, I got a little confused when reading the documentation because their section on using mixed capacities uh, implies that, at least the way I interpreted it, that you need to install them in the channel order or the correct channel order, but that's not actually true. You need to match the channels but still install them in the slots that they recommend. 
Anyway, long story short, I screwed up. I put them in the wrong spots, but it worked out because when I entered Mac OS, I was notified of my memory being misconfigured. And when I opened about this Mac, it gives me a big diagram of where the slots are in incorrect positions. And you can even print out a PDF, which is pretty funny, uh, telling you where your current RAM DIMMs are and where they should be moved for maximum performance. Uh, pretty cool. I'm gonna do that right now because I, I botched it. Okay, Quinn, you're thinking, memory, SSDs? USB-A, really? What is this, the 80s? Uh, well, true, USB-A didn't exist in the 80s. <laughs> okay, fine, let's talk about higher-end devices. Starting with this, a capture card from Blackmagic Design. This is a 4K capture card that can capture data from uh, HDMI 2.0 or higher, as well as SDI. Capture cards are not new to pro-end uh, computers, and not even new to pro-end Macs. Apple actually used to build capture cards into their own computers uh, back in the 90s during a period of time. Pretty cool. You should check my video out on one of these such devices if you haven't seen it already. But this capture card can be added over PCIe to the Mac. The question is, will it work? And I don't know, because this isn't technically intended to be used in a Mac, because what Mac has PCIe slots that's been made in the last 10 years? So let's give it a shot, see if it works. This next one I have really high hopes for because Blackmagic and Apple have a pretty good relationship. In fact, Blackmagic makes a hardware monitoring solution for the new Pro Display XDR. Anyway, you can download the Blackmagic desktop video suite, which allegedly includes support for uh, Blackmagic's capture cards. And if we open it, we see that indeed our DeckLink Mini is recognized by Mac OS X. Now, you can choose between the video inputs, be that SDI or HDMI. We're going to leave it at HDMI, and then we're going to open any capture suite is, is basically supported by this piece of hardware. But rather than open something like OBS, we're going to open Blackmagic's own uh, Media Express suite. And if we push the power button on this 2013 Mac Pro, we sh <sighs> I missed that sound. That's a good one. This thing is silent when it boots up. We should see momentarily, there it is, the Apple logo. So I can confirm that yes, this 4K capture card is fully operational on Mac OS. That's sweet. Let's talk audio. Apple has generally had pretty great IO built into their machines. There was a time when Apple actually had some of the best optical audio out on the market, but that's kind of no longer become a focus in part because most professionals, people who are doing real work, have used to ex uh, move to external devices. Many audio interfaces and DAX interface over USB and now Thunderbolt, which is pretty cool. But there still is a market for what used to be the old norm, sound cards. Creative just released the Sound Blaster, and I'm actually really excited to give it a shot on the Mac because it uses a really high quality ESS Sabre DAC, and the price point is actually rather compelling. It even has a built-in headphone amplifier and a number of items, which makes it seem like a pretty compelling option to some of the lower end DACs from companies like uh, Shit and Focusrite, which is pretty cool. Uh, now, one thing that's a little odd about this thing is that it does have a six pin PCIe header on it. Uh, it needs power. The PCI slot doesn't supply enough. Luckily, the Mac Pro supports this open standard, albeit a little bit strangely. With this $80 cable kit from Belkin, you can support and supply power to devices that require it inside of the motherboard. And so once we get that wired up, I guess we all leave it up to chance. I really don't think this one's gonna work, but let's find out. Yeah, this one is, uh... I'm bummed, this one's a major no-go. I thought because it was an audio device that it might work in macOS, but no. You open the sound panel and there is no recognized output or input from this specific creative sound card. And if you go to their website, you can look at their download section and they have a bunch of downloads, but it's only for Windows. They don't even have Linux drivers. That's a bit of a bummer. So this sound card is a little weird. We're gonna need this. This is the Sound Blaster box. Uh, basically, it connects to the sound card via mini HDMI of all ports. Obviously, it's not using the same standard. It just uses the connector type. But once you plug that in, you have your display light up here, and this gives you uh, volume control. It also lets you select your output via either headphones or speakers. And then you have actually a phantom power in, which is kind of cool if you want to record with a microphone. Uh, if we download the Sound Blaster command software in Windows, which we've done, we're booted into Windows via Bootcamp on this Mac Pro. Yeah, everything shows up fine. The card shows up, I can change all the settings, it works and sounds excellent. It's too bad it doesn't work in Mac OS, but I have one more idea. It works in Windows, but not in Mac OS. But maybe it'll work in Windows on Mac OS, and by extent, then work on Mac OS. So I decided to download Parallels, which allows you to run a virtualized system. And what's cool about Parallels is you can actually boot up your bootcamp partition as a VM inside of Mac OS, pretty cool. So let's plug this thing in and 
if... Hmm. No lights. That's not encouraging at all. Let's open the Sound Blaster command. And, uh, yeah, no. It says, please connect a supported device. Your audio device cannot be connected. Ah, well, it's worth a shot. Okay, let's talk graphics. Everyone knows that the base model Mac Pro ships with a pretty respectable graphics card, the Radeon Pro 580X. That thing sucks, PCMR. Is it not good? Oh, it's the worst. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't know, sorry, I'm a Mac guy. Uh, okay, so maybe you want to add a GPU to your computer. Everyone knows, or at least most people know, that AMD cards are the preferred uh, norm in Mac OS. Sure, you could buy one of Apple's really expensive MPX cards, and they are cool, and you can take advantage of the passive design. But if that's not your jam, you know, spending thousands and thousands of dollars on cards that are uh, moderately outdated, you might want to buy your own. Now, you can buy cards from AMD like the 5700 XT and the Vega 64 that work really, really well. But you could also maybe try something like this, an NVIDIA card, a GTX 1080 Ti. Now, you might be thinking, wait a minute, there are no drivers for Mac OS. And that's unfortunately true. High Sierra and later no longer support NVIDIA web drivers. I'm hoping that in the next couple of years this will change because that's a really lame argument that they're in. But for now, that is unfortunately the truth. But maybe we can get this card to work in boot camp. And if we can, does it screw up Mac OS? Let's find out. Oh, we're going to need power headers, right? Uh, no problem, because we've got that kit already. So we'll power that by the motherboard, and now we're ready to go. This is an LG Thunderbolt 4K display, and it's connected to the Mac Pro over, well, obviously Thunderbolt, which uses the GPU inside the Mac Pro, the 580X. That's always going to be used in Windows and Mac OS if you choose that I.O. option. But if I'm booted into Windows and I use a DisplayPort cable and plug it directly into the NVIDIA GPU, well, my monitor will switch to DisplayPort mode and check it out. I'm in Windows in Boot Camp. It recognizes my GTX 1080 Ti and has the latest driver installed. Now the question is, well, can you game on a Mac Pro? And can you game well on a Mac Pro? Stay tuned for a video on that coming next week. So there you have it. A couple of cards work great on Mac OS and Mac Pro, but most of them don't, at least not yet. And that's something you have to keep in mind. Look, it has been eight years since Apple had a Mac with PCI slots, which were accessible to the end user community. This Mac is a Mac Pro. It will be purchased by professionals. And so I actually wouldn't be surprised if over the next couple of months and years, a lot of the hardware on this desk that doesn't work right now will work eventually and that drivers will be developed. That's one of the reasons why this machine is so cool. Not because it's a really cool Mac, but because it's a PC. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a like. If you didn't, that other button seems to work okay too. Get subscribed for more awesome tech videos like this one. We've got more Mac Pro coverage coming, but most importantly, and as always, stay snazzy.